Centers for Disease Control and um, uh, U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Pre uh, Prevention. After joining the CDC staff, Dr. Morin served as a medical virologist uh, studying enteroviruses uh, and enteric uh, gastro gastroenteritis viruses uh, as chief of CDC's respiratory and special pathogens branch. And for two years, he studied Lassa fever in uh, Sierra Leone, West Africa. From 1982 to 1998, Dr. Morins was professor of tropical medicine at the University of Hawaii. And from 1987 to 1998, he was professor and chairman of, epi of the epidemiology department in the School of Public Health at that university. Dr. Morins has studied the epidemiology of viral hemorrhagic fevers, viral pathogenesis, and the integration and role of epidemiology in biomedical science and research. His career interest for over 35 years has been on emerging infectious diseases and on diseases of unknown etiology. In the past, tech, past decade, he has published and, spoken, published and spoken on numerous aspects of the history of epidemiology and infectious diseases. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Morns today, speaking on the forgotten, indispensable man, Joe Kenyon, and the birth of the NIH. Thank you, Jeff. That's uh, quite an introduction. I feel like uh, my time is almost up so we can all leave. Uh, anyways, uh, thank you, uh, not only Jeff, but thanks to the NLM for inviting me here. Uh, it's always a pleasure to join you for these seminars. And um, what I'm going to do today is um, not so much a history talk as a, as a, as a show and tell. You're going to see a lot of slides that go by very quickly. Um, but there's nothing written on those slides that you really need to read word for word because I will be um, telling you the story that I want to tell you. And this is about our founder, uh, Joe Kenyon. That's what, that's what he called himself. His medical letterhead paper said uh, from the office of Joe J. Kenyon. Um, not much is known about Kenyon. I think everybody in the audience knows that he is our founder of NIH and of NAID, my institute. Um, but very little is uh, known about him otherwise. And it turns out that that's um, kind of not for any particular reason, except that nobody has really looked. And uh, what I've been doing for about the past six years or so, um, as a hobby on my own in spare time, is trying to dig into the life and the history of uh, Joe Kenyon. And uh, now we also have a Stetton scholar, Ava Aron, who's in the audience here. I, it's dark, so I can't see her. But there she is. And, um, she is going to, uh, she's already joined us and starting to work on Kenyon too, and I think that uh, the baton will soon be passing to her, and uh, uh, sometime not too far in the future, I hope you'll be hearing from her again on Kenyon. So let me give a little background. Yes, by the way, um, what, what you're looking at is a, an actual photograph of Joe Kenyon. That's a little baby. Uh, 1860, he was born, and this is probably early 1861, sitting on the lap of his father, who was a, uh, uh, a surgeon in the Confederate Army during the Civil War. Now, to give you a little background on the uh, Marine Hospital Service, which became the Public Health Service, um, there were terrible yellow fever epidemics that occurred in the 1790s, the early days of the United States. And in 1798, President Adams uh, signed a bill authorizing an act for the relief of sick and disabled seamen, which became the Marine Hospital Service and eventually what is now the Public Health Service. Um, there were no quarantine provisions of that act because quarantine was then the, under the purview of uh, the states. But over time, uh, particularly in the 1870s, um, the Marine Hospital Service began to conduct quarantine in assisting the states in their quarantine activities. And uh, here you see some pictures of what quarantine was like. In the, in the middle and late 1800s, quarantine was the major public health activity. There was the concern that these epidemic and pandemic diseases that everybody feared, uh, particularly cholera, plague, yellow fever, and smallpox, would be imported from abroad, where they were often epidemic or pandemic. And the major public health activity was to try to keep them out with quarantine. And that meant greeting ships, fumigating ships, fumigating the baggages of passengers and the passengers themselves. This was all in the era before microbiology. But during this time, from the 1830s until the 1870s, um, we were, uh, in retrospect, it's clear we were approaching the era of microbiology in which we would realize that most of these epidemic diseases were caused by single organisms. Um, the first um, human infectious disease to be fully established and proven by modern criteria was anthrax in 
uh, based on the work of Casimir Devane over about 25 years, but capped off by Koch's publication in 1876. Um, and anthrax was the first human infectious diseases to be established as a human infectious disease by um, the new microbiology criteria. We now call those criteria Koch's postulates. Here you see Koch, the hand drawing he made in 1876, and the photomicrograph, one of the first photomicrographs I've ever seen published the following year in 1877. <clears throat> As we go forward now talking about Joe Kenyon, I'm going to show you a few photographs. You'll see all of these again. Uh, and uh, you'll, you'll also see a little yellow, um, little yellow uh, uh, circle here. Uh, and if you haven't figured out what that is, we'll talk about it a little bit uh, later. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about the early life of Kenyon. Uh, about his birth in 1860, and so on. You don't need to look at this carefully because I'm going to go over it. He was born in East Bend, North Carolina. Uh, that's where the family had lived. His father had been born in that area. And um, as, as we'll see, he moved uh, quite a bit during his life. Now, I mentioned his father was a, um, as a surgeon in the Confederate Army. And they lived in a very rural part of the Appalachian Mountains where there was not much uh, civilization there. These were tiny little towns. But somehow, for some reason, his father was able to get a tremendous education. The Kenyans seemed to be um, a progressive, energetic, independent, um, almost itinerant family. And you can see that his father went east to the East Coast to get training, ended up with first a law degree and then a medical degree from uh, Bellevue, Hospital Medical School, or what became Bellevue Hospital Medical School, New York University. During the, so Kenyon was born in 1860. Of course, the Civil War started within the year. And his dad left him, Joe, and his infant sister and the mother at home and went off to fight the Civil War. Um, you're looking at the battle flag that, uh, that, uh, that Kenyon carried, or one like it. And uh, the, for those who know the Confederate anthem, Dixie, uh, there is a, you know, there, there are verses that go on forever and ever, hundreds of them probably, but there is a verse that mentions Kenyon the father uh, and his exploits in the Civil War. Well, after the war, the Kenyans moved to, uh, to western Mississippi. This was really the frontier. The railroad had got there just the year before, and um, this was uh, in Centerview, Missouri, where they settled, was the last outpost for trading and sending off supplies on the wagons that went west. And this was a really wild and lawless place. The remnants of Quantrill's raiders were there. Uh, Jesse James and the James gang was there. There were constant murders and vigilante group lynchings. Um, and this is the environment that Ken Newton grew up in as a child from the age of five. Um, I don't have any photograph of Kenyon's residence, but a house that was very close to where the Kenyans lived is shown in the lower left-hand corner. So Kenyon uh, lived in this environment, but somehow got training through a preceptor, meaning uh, a, a tutor. And by the age of 14, he was studying algebra and geometry and uh, was also speaking German, French, and Spanish. Pretty remarkable for the Wild West. And uh, apparently must have been relatively promising as a student. When he um, uh, was of the age, in those days, you didn't have to graduate from high school. He may, may not have been able to. But he transitioned into apprenticing with his father, probably went with his dad to see patients uh, in, in their country practice. And then in the year 1881, went to St. Louis uh, East and uh, took one course in the newly created St. Louis College of Physicians and Surgeons, which you see a picture of here. And after that, went on to Bellevue Hospital Medical College, New York, one of the, the, top, med one of the top medical schools in the country, and took courses under some of the great men of those days, including Austin Flint, you see his name circled here. It may be a little dark. I'm not sure if you can see that. But Austin Flint, for whom the Austin Flint murmur is named, one of the American fathers of cardiology and a famous internist of that era, uh, was his teacher. After medical school, uh, Kenyon continued on and took postgraduate courses in, um, in uh, surgery, in obstetrics, uh, in toxicology, and uh, in uh, another subject which I don't remember at the moment and was also practicing in New York City, presumably to make the money to continue his postgraduate education throughout the rest of the year of uh, 1882. So he graduated in March of 1882 and stayed there for the rest of that year and uh, was apparently doing fine until he lost his very first patient, a little girl with diphtheria who died of diphtheria uh, 
and it was a big uh, it was a big turning point in his life. He was just devastated by the loss of his first uh, patient by a disease he couldn't uh, uh, couldn't control, couldn't cure, and he was he was very depressed and hard on himself. And his letters at that time um, show that he was uh, near to quitting medicine. He wanted to just give it all up. He couldn't bear to see uh, a little child die. He was his patient, but he didn't quit. He went back home and um, worked with his father uh, for three years in private practice, uh, seeing mostly um, little children and, um, and pregnant women and charging a dollar for a house visit and five dollars for a delivery, uh, and also seeing his father's deadbeat patients who weren't paying their money, uh, pay paying their bills. Uh, maybe his father stuck him with the deadbeat patients, I don't really know. But the remarkable thing is that during this time, he somehow got a hold of a microscope. He, there, were, there was no microscopy in New York when he had been in medical school or postgraduate courses. I'm sorry, there was microscopy, but there was no bacteriology. And so he'd had no bacteriology training in New York. But he knew this was a coming thing, got a microscope, and began studying farm animal diseases, particularly anthrax and, um, uh, uh, and uh, pasteurolosis. And then in 1885, he decided to go back to New York to study under an old classmate of his at the medical school, Herman Biggs, who had become an instructor in a brand new laboratory set up by Andrew Carnegie at Bellevue. And that laboratory is said to be the first or one of the first in the United States to actually do bacteriology. Um, that was 1885. By early 1886, he decided he wanted to join the Marine Hospital Service. Um, he wrote them a letter and said, what do I have to do to get in? And this is uh, the reply from uh, Surgeon General John Hamilton uh, saying, you've got to come and take the test. So he did come and take the test, the entrance exam for the Marine Hospital Service. And uh, in, in supporting letters and political control uh, interference, he uh, pulled on the people you see here, who I'll take a minute to mention who they are. Um, in the upper left, you see Fred Dennis. He is one of his professors from Bellevue who became one of the prominent surgeons in the United States. Uh, Austin Flint, who, of course, I've mentioned already, he got letters from them. He also got a letter from Biggs, who was about the same age as he was. Uh, and um, he uh, called on his uh, Missouri senator, Francis Cockrell. Cockrell had been a general in the Confederate Army and a great war hero, and uh, now he was a uh, Missouri state senator. And uh, the governor, um, uh, Thomas Crittenden, who'd been on the Union side, and had been a colonel and a moderately famous colonel in the, uh, uh, in the, uh, in the Union Army. Um, and then two other people I want to mention. This fellow is really interesting. Professor Frank James had been his professor in St. Louis in 1881. And James was interesting because he had spent much time in his youth in Europe training with Justus Liebig, uh, probably the leading, one of the leading chemists, medical chemists of that era, and an infectious disease theorist. And when the Civil War broke out, James was in Germany, uh, decided to come back to the United States, stopped off at the embassy in Germany, and was asked to take secret papers to Confederate President Jefferson Davis, which he did. Uh, he, went to, he went through the Union lines and got to Richmond to meet with Jefferson Davis. And in discussing things, Davis found out he was a chemist and knew how to make explosives. So Davis hired him on as a personal assistant and terrorist, and he spent the rest of the war blowing up Union ships and uh, uh, undertaking spy activities for the Confederacy. And then when the war was over, he went to be a medical school professor. Uh, and uh, Kenyon met him and got a letter of recommendation from him. This other fellow here, Preston Bailhash, uh, was, a, uh, is, was at the time a surgeon, a senior surgeon in the Marine Hospital Service where Kenyon was applying. And um, he had been uh, a good friend of President Lincoln in the White House. He played games with Lincoln, uh, sports games and card games, I believe, and was also the physician who took care of President Lincoln's children. And he was Kenyon's uncle. So it may be that uh, Bailhash and others, there, there's a, all these connections suggest there may have been some strings pulled to get him into the Marine Hospital Service. Uh, he took the entrance exam and barely passed it. He was fifth out of nine with a score of 73, 70 being the cutoff. But he got in and he joined the Marine Hospital Service in 1886. And while he was waiting to hear about his commission, uh, that is after he'd been accepted but before he was able to start, um, his two-year-old daughter, Betty, died of diphtheria, uh, the same disease that had killed his first patient a few years earlier. And this was just a devastating tragedy that he could never forget. 
I want to point out, too, uh, for those of you who uh, are interested in this, why I circled this twice, this is a tripwire for a camera. It turns out that Joe Kenyon was a, uh, uh, a very sophisticated amateur photographer. And um, a lot of, if you see a, if you see somebody in a picture in, you, in this era and you can't make out who it is, and there's a little line in his left hand or his right hand, that's probably Joe Kenyon uh, pulling the trigger. Uh, the, I haven't mentioned yet, but I will later, that uh, the great-grandchildren of Joe Kenyon we've made connections with, and um, a huge amount of his personal material, including hundreds of photographs that he took and processed in his dark room, are in existence and we hope will someday in the not too far distant future be donated to NIH. <clears throat> so Kenyon got into the Marine Hospital Service in 1886. He was assigned to Staten Island, where, uh, which was near Ellis Island, and it was the major port of entry for cholera and other diseases that would be imported from Europe. Um, he took care of patients on these wards, and he got rid of his hippie haircut and uh, cleaned up his act. This is 1887, one year later, and now this is the clean-cut Joe Kenyon. Uh, and in 1887, Surgeon General Hamilton um, authorized Kenyon to set up a, what came to be called a hygienic laboratory in a, in a ground floor room in the, uh, in the Stapleton Staten Island Hospital. Now Hamilton, the Surgeon General, had uh, been very interested in cholera and had just co-written a book about it, published in 1885, and it's very likely that he was looking for somebody like Kenyon to come along and put the Marine Hospital Service and him on the map. Uh, by isolating cholera, which had never been isolated in the United States. Lo and behold, within two years of opening the, uh, within two months of opening the hygienic lab, um, Kenyon isolated cholera from a patient in New York uh, who came in on a ship from Italy, along with a fellow Marine Hospital Service officer, Samuel Treat Armstrong, who you see here, son of a Missouri senator. All these connections are, you know, there's a huge amount of civil war and uh, family connections that go on here. Uh, Armstrong went on to become a famous psychiatrist, but at the time he was just the senior guy working with Kenyon. And Kenyon made the isolation of cholera, which was national news, and um, it, it sort of helped put the Marine Hospital Service on the map and fend off a competing federal entity called the National Board of Health, which was uh, headed by our guy, John Shaw Billing, sorry, NLM. And, uh, uh, and uh, the National Board of Health was eventually uh, swept by the wayside, many historians say, in part because of Kenyon. So here we see Kenyon at the Stapleton Staten Island Hospital. This is Kenyon. This is his boss, uh, uh, later Surgeon General Walter Wyman. And this is the back of the hospital, the Stapleton Hospital. These are tuberculosis isolation tents. Kenyon, when, once he got there, one of the first things he did is say, hey, Coke isolated tuberculosis in 1882, it's a bug, it can be transmitted. Uh, why don't we isolate patients? That wasn't being done in the United States. He was probably one of the first. And uh, these isolation tents were set up. Kenyon tried to get all the other marine hospitals to uh, isolate uh, as well, but he wasn't very successful in that. Now we're looking at the Stapleton Hospital still exists today. This is uh, thanks to Google Satellite. This is the Google Satellite looking down on the hospital. The same one you saw in the picture, and we know from historical records that the hygienic laboratory was in one of these ground floor rooms, either on this side, this is the front, or it's a mirror image in the back. And um, one of the things I hope we can do someday before they condemn this building, it's, it's been unoccupied for 30 years, uh, but before they tear it down, is to identify where the actual room was. And we should be able to do that because of chemicals that were used, residue would exist today, uh, certain laboratory chemicals that were used, and also these, um, you know, very heavy cabinets were, in the days before drywall, were undoubtedly bolted into the walls, and even if they've put up drywall over it, it should be possible to, uh, to identify where that room was, and I hope someday we can do that. Uh, within a year, with, I'm sorry, within three years of Kenyon joining, and two years of the Marine Hospital setting up the hygienic lab, uh, the government set up a spin-off lab in the Dry Tortugas, Florida, headed by Kenyon's assistant at the time, Henry Gettings, and um, this is the building in which that laboratory was set up. We don't have any picture of the laboratory. So just to fast forward a minute about Kenyon's career, um, and I'm going to talk about all these things, so no need to look at these uh, things. He had a long federal career that began with the Marine Hospital Service, went into the Navy Reserves when he uh, 
left the Marine Hospital Service and ended up in the Army. He was in uniform continually uh, in the uniform service his whole adult life after 1886. In 1891, the Hygienic Laboratory left Staten Island and moved to Washington, D.C. This is the Butler Building. It no longer exists. Uh, and the Marine Hospital Service uh, was in the Butler Building, and the Hygienic Laboratory took over the whole fourth floor. Um, I don't have a picture of the Butler Building uh, from the Capitol Dome. This is a Capitol Dome view looking down Pennsylvania Avenue southeast. The Butler Building is just out of the picture, unfortunately. But here we see uh, the Capitol in the 1890s. And Kenyon's personal residence was just about here. And the Butler Building is somewhere back in here, covered by the, uh, uh, by the uh, right-hand wing of the White House, uh, of the Capitol, rather. And here we can see it from overhead. Uh, this is an 1817 map, a street map. I can't find an 1890s street map. Uh, and the, and the, the, the streets had been changed already by 1917 and were changed further to now. But Kenyon lived right here at 210 New Jersey Avenue Northwest, and he worked in the Butler Building right here at uh, New Jersey Avenue Southeast at B Street. And uh, he would have had this. I've always imagined which way did he walk to get to work, either around the Capitol or behind it. We don't know. But this is a view standing on where Kenyon's house was, uh, looking southeast. And it, this would have been the view he had from his front yard as he looked at the north wing of the Capitol. Now, in the Marine Hospital Service, Kenyon um, went far and wide traveling. He went to Europe a number of times, and he worked personally with Koch and Koch's lab and became, Koch sort of treated him apparently as kind of a, of a son, took him under his wing, and they had a lot of long talks together. Um, Koch set him doing experiments and uh, gave him reagents, which he brought back. And he also studied in uh, Paris with Pasteur on sequential trips and uh, got to know a lot of the famous scientists of that day. Um, in, in Berlin, his closest contacts were Robert Koch and uh, later Baron uh, Kinesato, who became one of his closest friends. Um, and he also, uh, Kenyon also worked with Virchow, who at that time was a critic of Koch. And um, in, in the Pasteur lab, his closest friend became uh, Rue. So when Kenyon came back from Berlin, uh, when Kenyon was in Berlin in 1894, something that was the most astonishing breakthrough of that era, it's hard to remember now, but uh, it's, it was really, it astonished everybody, including Kenyon, and that is the discovery of diphtheria antitoxin, an actual preparation that could be made in horses that would save the lives of children dying with diphtheria. It was antibodies, uh, immune serums made in horses that had large blood volume. You could give this to little kids and it would save their lives. And Kenyon got the formulas and uh, sent it all back. Even while he was in Europe, he cabled it back to Gettings and said, let's set up some research experiments. Went into the hospitals here in DC. And uh, I'm sorry, in New York, rather. They were still up in New York when this happened. And um, no, they were not. They were down here. What am I saying? <laughs> I'm getting, no, they were down in DC. And, uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, the bottom line is he introduced antiserum and distributed in the United States and uh, it was a great breakthrough. He also started, he'd been to Paris and learned how to make rabies vaccines, so now he was making that virtually every biological that could be made. And he became the first physician to treat smallpox with an immune serum. And, um, you know, his research in this era was just phenomenal. Now, of course, he was also working with stains. That was one of the major microbiology techniques in those days. And some of you who are physicians may remember the Kenyan stain for AFB, which is Nowadays, not as popular as the Zeal Nielsen stain, but still, uh, Kenyans, if you Google Kenyon, you'll come up on endless um, references for the stain. Um, he also began moving beyond bacteriologic support for the Marine Hospital Service labs, and he serviced all of the Marine Hospital uh, hospitals and uh, officers all around the country, and indeed abroad. But he also began doing general public health research related to problems in uh, the civilian life, including District of Columbia, which had a huge water problem. The Potomac was contaminated. Most of the water supplies in the city were contaminated. Typhoid fever, all sorts of other things. And he began working with colleagues like Theobald Smith to do groundbreaking studies on uh, essentially enteric diseases that were waterborne. Uh, and in fact, there was a time when these studies were said to be the greatest public health studies 
ever conducted. Now we forget about them. They don't seem so great. But back at the time, they were more groundbreaking than anything that Koch and Pasteur had done in Europe, according to many Americans. He was the first to develop a credible theory on why uh, respiratory diseases occur in the winter. And although uh, it's not clear from the research, it, it, there are indications, because he didn't publish it, there are indications that he may have made the first pneumococcal antiserum and the first uh, pneumococcal vaccine. He was also an inventor. He had a number of uh, uh, pieces of equipment. You see some of them here. Uh, made with a, with a company he worked with, uh, and these were for fumigating and disinfecting. They're essentially autoclaves and fumigators, and there's a whole bunch of them. And these were called Kenyan devices, Kenyan disinfecting chambers, and Kenyan sulfur fumigators, and all sorts of things that he made. And the Marine Hospital Service and others used them. When the uh, House of Representatives, because he was so close, he knew a lot of senators and congressmen, and he was in the same clubs with them anyways. So when the House of Representatives decided that the, the uh, chambers, the House chambers, were just impossibly badly ventilated and stunk to high heaven. They brought in Kenyon and an engineer to do an investigation. He investigated the Capitol and, um, and uh, made a, uh, a, uh, uh, a fairly extensive report, which was, of course, a scientific report, and told the House of Representatives what they needed to do to get better ventilation, and they did it. But it's also interesting that his... His, uh, his report has a very wry between the lines comments, which uh, the implication of which is if the congressman would stop spitting tobacco juice on the carpet, it wouldn't smell so bad in here. Uh, when the World's Fair came along in 1893, Kenyon took an exhibit to the World's Fair. You see it all boxed up here, and here it is uh, set up. And it's one of the things that was uh, little known, and perhaps even unknown about Kenyon, is he developed a uh, 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 a better vaccination technique for smallpox vaccination before we had the bifurcated needle. And uh, that was important because people who got smallpox vaccination often got infections. And there needed to be a technique which would work and which would not cause infections. And he developed one, never published it, but he just shared it widely. And people referred to it for decades as the Kenyan technique. Um, he brought into his laboratory a, a scientist from the Venezuelan delegation named Eduardo uh, Andrade Penny. And um, probably because he trained him in the lab for a few years and sent him back to set up his own activity in Venezuela, um, uh, he w received the highest award from Venezuela, the uh, Order of Bolivar, which you see here. Now, during his time in Washington, he um, also was a professor at Georgetown, got a degree at Georgetown, a PhD. All the time he's doing all this research. I don't know how the guy, he probably, probably was like Dr. Fauci. He never went home. He just worked all the time. And um, uh, he got a PhD from Georgetown. And in addition to that, he started experimenting with a brand new technique that he loved called radiology. And um, afterwards, uh, in, in his later life in DC, he left Georgetown and became a professor of pathology and bacteriology at George Washington U. When the Spanish-American War started and Teddy Roosevelt and the Rough Riders went down to Cuba to fight, uh, they had to be quarantined when they came back because there was a lot of diseases down there that could be imported yellow fever, malaria, and so on. And so Kenyon volunteered to put them under quarantine on Long Island, and, um, and he was sent there to do that. And here you see some pictures of the quarantine with President Roosevelt in the center. I mean, I'm sorry, future President Roosevelt in the center, and President McKinley coming to visit all the time Kenyon has them under quarantine. And um, if these videos play, this is actually Teddy Roosevelt and the Rough Riders staging their uh, charge on San Juan Hill in Montauk, Long Island, under Kenyon's quarantine. I guess they had nothing better to do except restage, a, uh, uh, restage an enactment of the charge on San Juan Hill. Um, the beginning of this uh, video clip says 1903. That's the copyright year. This was obviously several years earlier than that. Now here's Kenyon uh, and her quarantine. You see him in his oilskin coat. Uh, this, this probably, he was wearing these because this is what you had to wear when you went in and fumigated. At the very least, you were spraying hot steam around. It would get your clothes all messed up with hot steam. But oftentimes, um, uh, fumigation was done with sulfur, and, uh, which, was, which would be corrosive. And later on, around this time, he introduced uh, formaldehyde as a fumigating agent. So this is protective clothing. Um, here is the hygienic laboratory uh, around 1889, probably 1899 probably early 1899, 
And uh, it's interesting to see some of the people in here. Uh, Ezra Sprague was his then uh, number two in charge. And a brand new uh, officer, Hugh Cumming, who later became the Surgeon General. And um, uh, another young trainee, these guys were trainees, uh, J.M. Eager, who later became Assistant Surgeon General. This is the Butler Building, fourth floor. Um, these are the men who were Kenyon's assistants during the 1890s, Henry Downs Getting, the fellow who set up the Dry Tortugas Lab, Ezra Kimball Sprague, the fellow we just saw in the picture, and his successor, who was never really his assistant, but became a great uh, laboratory director after Kenyon, Milton Rosenau, and, uh, uh, and uh, also uh, a great leader in public health. So 1900 comes along, and Wyman, the Surgeon General, now the Surgeon General, decides he's going to transfer Kenyon to San Francisco and ask him to step down as head of the lab after 13 years. And uh, this may sound like a demotion, but in fact, uh, a plague pandemic was occurring, and the plague was the most feared disease of all. People remembered the Black Death of the 14th century and um, needed to do something about it. Kenyon sent him to San Francisco, where he set up the quarantine and was put in charge of all quarantine on the West Coast. And uh, here we see the quarantine station. Uh, a little footnote is, in addition to quarantine, he had to inspect arriving immigrants to disqualify them if they had a disease or a disability. And one of the guys he was almost ready to uh, send back to Japan was uh, a young man named uh, Hideo Noguchi, but he took pity on him for some reason. Noguchi went on to be a great scientist in America and discovered the cause of syphilis. This is Kenyon's boarding launch, the quarantine in San Francisco, and this is the actual flag he used uh, on that ship. Uh, you see it circled in the front. On March 6th, eight, uh, 1900, plague indeed broke out in San Francisco which brought about one of the most um, infamous uh, public health events in all of uh, United States history. And it's too complicated to go into in detail here. Uh, I'm sorry, but uh, it's just uh, an extraordinarily complicated thing. And I'll try to skim over it in thumbnail because it, uh, it was the greatest challenge for the Marine Hospital Service and it ended the career of Kenyon. So uh, Kenyon was the one who made the isolations and um, the Board of Health of San Francisco immediately put Chinatown under quarantine, the idea being that uh, any plague case that came in was going to be brought by Chinese visitors, and any plague cases that occurred in San Francisco would be in Chinese residents, which in fact turned out to be true. But of course, not only the Chinese, but the, but the businessmen in California went crazy because this was terribly bad for business to have the Black Death organism isolated in San Francisco. So the governor and everybody else de denied that there was an epidemic. Meanwhile, Kenyon and the health board uh, uh, in San Francisco tried to get rid of it, uh, tried to get rid of the epidemic by fumigating the sewers and doing house-to-house -house searches. They even brought in the so-called Danis virus, one of the first attempts to biologically eradicate a disease. The Danis virus turned out to be Salmonella enteritidis, by the way, and it was used in, uh, uh, for rat control uh, as late as the 1950s in uh, East, uh, Eastern Europe. Anyways, California Governor Gage, down in the lower left-hand corner, uh, and his uh, California State Board absolutely denied and certified that plague existed. Meanwhile, case totals were mounting. They went up to almost 100 over the first two years. And despite the fact that there were cases in, in other Pacific ports, Gage just denied it existed. All of this took place in an in a, in a era of, of violent racism, anti-Chinese and anti-Japanese um, uh, prejudice. And Kenyon was caught in the middle of that. And the governor personally accused Kenyon of uh, uh, being, uh, of uh, orchestrating a plague fake so as to attract more federal and state and city dollars uh, into public health. And it was in all the newspapers, this was national news by the way, the whole country followed this week after week, month after month, and Kenyon was vilified as a plague faker who was introducing plague. Uh, and uh, as I've said, I think uh, Governor Gage formally, officially, publicly accused him of being a bioterrorist by trying to plant um, plague organisms on the bodies of Chinese who had died of other things. And a big scandal erupted. It was a horrible story. It's, been, it's being written about now, even a hundred and some odd years later. Uh, but the bottom line of it was the California governor and the Republican Party was not going to let up unless they made a deal. And so in President McKinley's office, a deal was cut as follows. The governor
Welfare of California uh, and the state of California would allow the Marine Hospital Service to come in and take charge of plague eradication on two conditions. They never had to admit the plague existed in the first place and Kenyon would be fired. They fired him. Uh, Henry Rose Carter, the fellow, the Marine Hospital Service officer who helped uh, Walter Reed later, uh, helped Walter Reed discover the transmission of yellow fever, was one of his closest friends, and and urged him not to not to leave the Marine Hospital Service. Uh, and as you can see here, said, "Don't do it, old man. Believe me, your life and good works will never be lost." Uh, nevertheless, Kenyon did resign, and uh, during the process, Walter Wyman called in an outside expert committee of uh, three of the top bacteriologists in the country, Simon Flexler, Llewellyn Barker, and Fred Novi, and uh, they all verified that all of Kenyon's work was correct. The isolations were correct. They re-isolated plague. Um, there was really no more doubt, if there ever was, the plague was there, but it didn't save Kenyon. During the time he was in San Francisco, citizens got together and took out a $7,000 contract on his life. He had to carry firearms at all times and have a launch ready to leave. The San Francisco city government had to assign uh, up to 100 policemen at one time to protect him, and at another point, the United States Army had to be called in to protect him. And if that wasn't the worst thing, the day he was supposed to leave San Francisco, he was charged with murder. And uh, it turned out he had to go to court and uh, clear his name, and it turned out to be a case of mistaken identity, but a man who he had once vaccinated, who was a deaf mute, claimed that Kenyon uh, had pulled out his fired arm, firearms when he was sitting in a boat offshore and had fired on him and tried to kill him. Um, when all the testimony came out, what, what had happened is that the military had fired on him, the U.S. Army had fired on him because a military prisoner had escaped, was running in the direction of the waterfront where the boat was. They had assumed that the deaf man, didn't know he was deaf, of course, they assumed that the deaf man was uh, an accomplice in a getaway boat and Kenyon was there trying to warn the poor man to get out of the way because he was going to be fired on, um, and uh, he uh, was accused himself. So, but I think he took it uh, with as good a humor as he could and said it was really a tragic occurrence, but all tragedies are tempered with comedy. Um, this is Fred Ackerman, and I show his picture for one reason. Uh, I'm going to show you a video now, and I want, to, I want to point out something. Fred Ackerman was a cameraman who was in San Francisco on September 15, 1900, filming in Chinatown. This is 1900, not 1903, the copyright date. I want you to watch a particular man. The archives say this is the health inspection team inspecting Chinatown on September 15, 1900. This is obviously a staged event, all these Inspectors are walking towards the camera, and then this man in a uniform is coming back across the screen, going around to walk towards the cameraman as well. We have no idea who these people were, but we know it was a health inspection team. We know that the man uh, in uniform has a uniform that looks exactly like a Marine Hospital Service uniform. I've sat down at the Library of Congress and gone over the paper prints frame by frame, and, and tried to measure where the buttons are, where the insignia on the cap is. Um, everything about the uniform is consistent with a Marine Hospital Service uniform. So the question is, could this be Kenyon? Well, we don't know. Uh, there's probably no way to prove it. Um, I've scoured the newspapers for that day and several days thereafter, and there were like eight San Francisco newspapers, so it's a lot of work, trying to find some me me mention in the newspaper of Fred Ackerman uh, being uh, in town. Well, we know he was in town. I found the uh, evidence that he checked into a particular hotel. So Ackerman was in town. But uh, who was this in the photograph, we, in the movie, we don't really know. But I think it's an interesting thing to speculate that it could be Kenyon, because it's obviously a bearded man in a, hos in a uniform that's consistent with the Marine Hospital Service uniform. Ten years later, so Kenyon left. Ten years later, uh, Senator Robert Owen, the first Cherokee senator in the United States, introduced a bill to create a national department of health headed by a cabinet secretary, uh, very much along the lines of what Kenyon had proposed, by the way. And in a March 24, 1910 speech on the Senate floor, recalled the events of San Francisco 10 years earlier and uh, defended Kenyon and all the members of the Marine Hospital Service. 
As Kenyon was leaving uh, the Marine Hospital Service to into private life, um, a, uh, the Congress passed two acts, one of which, and both of these acts were related to legislation that he, Kenyon, had drafted. The first one was an act uh, uh, to, uh, it's called the Biologics Control Act, which eventually led to the FDA. Kenyon had been a passionate uh, uh, defender of uh, the importance of um, standardizing the production of biologics and maintaining quality control with federal regulation. Uh, and uh, those, uh, that act passed July 1st, 1902. And at the same time, another act he had drafted which formalized the hygienic laboratory uh, into uh, uh, an actual formal entity uh, with three new divisions, expanded powers and expanded personnel, uh, the first formal legislation creating what became the NIH. So Kenyon left and went to work for the Mulford Company with whom he'd worked in, one, this is one of two biologics companies, the other being Park Davis, that existed at the time. And Kenyon had worked with them while he was in the Marine Hospital Service to help them learn how to make safe biologicals. Now he went there for four years and did that with Mulford. And then after four years, he left and came back to Washington, D.C. as the director of the bacteriology laboratory in the uh, D.C. Health Department. We know very little about him during that time except that he was active in professional societies, including the ones you see here. He was a president of what became the ASM. He was a vice president of both the APA, American Public Health Association and the organization that became the American Society of Tropical Medicine. And he was clearly one of the leaders in uh, public health around the country. Some interesting sidelights about him personally, just to give you a flavor of who he was as a man. Uh, in 1889, and they went back to Centerview, Missouri, and they dug up a body, a hermetically sealed casket, the casket that had been buried for 29 years. Uh, and as you can see, this was the body of uh, Mrs. Kenyon, Lizzie Kenyon's mother, who had died shortly after Mrs. Kenyon was born. And so Lizzie Kenyon had never seen her own mother. Uh, and they got the body to be dug up so she could open the sealed casket and look on her mother's face for the only time in her life and um, uh, apparently the, the mother was as beautiful in death after 29 years as she was in life, or, so the newspaper says. Uh, kind of a strange story, but uh, Kenyon was a strange guy. Uh, Kenyon also in San Francisco uh, brought in two dogs from Asia uh, Nick called, that he named Nip and Chow, which were Chow dogs at that time, I guess. I don't know much about dogs, but if anybody does, and there were virtually no chow dogs in the United States then. It was a rare exotic breed, and they were, of course, of great value, but also uh, the Chinese uh, 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 coveted them as a banquet delicacy, so he had to guard them very carefully. And then in 1910, there was a front page story on, in the New York Times uh, about another person, not Kenyon, who, who uh, cites Kenyon's theory about how you can tell a person's musical ab ability by looking at their ears. There's no evidence that Kenyon ever did say that himself, except that that's what it said in the newspaper. So what was Kenyon's vision for a, a national health organization? Uh, he had the, a, a vision that was similar to what other men who came of age in the 1870s had. He, see, he saw in this era, long before we had an HHS, he saw a national sanitary organization um, that would be a combination of research, service and outbreak investigation, in biologics control. Essentially, he envisioned the activities that are now uh, in the NIH, the CDC, and the FDA. And he was passionate about that and spoke about it. Uh, and he, again and again in his retirement years, talked about how we needed to have a national health agency. In um, 1914, the war broke out, and the United States entered it in 1917. By this time, Kenyon was 56 years old and he had lymphosarcoma of the neck. But he finagled somehow to get back in uniform and got appointed as an army major. He was a patriot all his life, and he'd always been in uniform. He left the U.S. Navy Reserves, got into the army as an expert epidemiologist, and entered on active duty. When his health deteriorated, you see him in uniform here on the right in his army uniform. When his health deteriorated, he was assigned to the Army Medical Museum here in Washington, D.C. in December, and then he died on active duty on Valentine's Day, 14 February, 1919. Here you see his draft of his last will and testament on the left and his letter to his wife, Elizabeth, 
asking that when he died, he be buried with their daughter, Betty, who had died of uh, diphtheria so many years before. Here's the house he died in as it looked at the time. Better point this in the right direction. And as it looks today, uh, and uh, I would love to see that house someday. It's privately owned now, and uh, we haven't yet attempted to try to get into it, but uh, I suppose one could, out, you know, out of uniform and not on active duty, I suppose one could knock on the door and ask the people who live there if they knew the history of the house. So Kenyon was buried with their daughter, Betty. Here's Betty's gravestone. Uh, and when he died in 1919, his wife, believing that someday he ex would be exonerated and that he would be acknowledged as a great man, uh, collected all his papers and memorabilia, boxed them all up, and they have sat in boxes now for over, for almost 100 years, for 90-some years, where we have now located them in the possession of two of the great-grandchildren. Mrs. Kenyon died in 1948, and she and her husband, Joe Kenyon, and their daughter, Betty, were united in the same grave site here in Centerview, Missouri. Kenyon uh, and all the other, the names of Joseph Kenyon and all the other men who died on active duty in World War I are buried in the cornerstone of the memorial on the mall. And uh, because he had been a DC employee, um, a statue was uh, erected, to, a marble statue was erected and placed in City Hall honoring all the men and women who had died in service, uh, who had been DC employees, who uh, died in service in World War I. And here you see Kenyon's name. It's, it took me a while to find this, because when I went down to City Hall, everybody assured me that no such thing existed. But then I found a janitor who said, oh, you mean that old statue that's sitting in that old stairwell over there. Maybe that's the one. So I went over and looked at it, and sure enough, there it was. And it's hard to see, but uh, Joseph J. K Major Joseph J. Kenyon is listed among them. In 1994, when World War II started, a Liberty ship was commissioned named the Joseph James Kenyon. And uh, this is not it. This is a similar one. There were several hundred similar ships constructed during the war. Um, this is one that looked exactly like it, and uh, uh, it saw service in uh, World War II. So who was Joe Kenyon? By the way, the, the code name, his code name was a Butman. Everybody had a code name in those days. It's very hard to tell who a person was as a human being, but I've speculated on some things here. I won't read them all for you, but he was clearly a big picture guy, a behind the scenes kind of guy, very hardworking, loyal, patriotic, um, not necessarily a mover and shaker, not necessarily a leader of men, but greatly, um, uh, greatly admired and, and uh, uh, beloved even by his fellow scientists. It's interesting to listen to him talk and uh, listen to the transcripts of his talking in national meetings. He never speculated. He never went beyond the data. He only spoke from what the data showed and um, was very circumspect in everything he said scientifically. But personally, he was funny, witty, he made jokes, he wrote stories and poems, and appeared to have been sort of an ebullient southern gentleman. Uh, I think to some extent you can tell what people are like by the friends and colleagues they left behind. Here was three of his closest friends in the Marine Hospital Service, Henry Rose Carter, who helped Walter Reed figure out what to do to discover the cause of yellow fever, uh, Josef Goldberger, a Hungarian immigrant uh, who came here and called himself Joe, and eventually discovered the cause of pellagra. He's in, of an era slightly later than Kenyon's time in the Marine Hospital Service, and they were never working in the same city in the Marine Hospital Service, but somehow they became friends. And then Milton Rosenau, one of the great leaders of public health who succeeded Kenyon as lab director. And when I was studying preventive medicine, and Jeff mentioned I have a board certification in preventive medicine, when I was studying for those boards in the 1970s, um, Maxie Rosenau was the book that I read. So that book, which the first edition came out in 1913, it's still in print, it's still the Bible of preventive medicine. Um, two of the people he trained went on to be Surgeon Generals, Hugh Cumming, we saw a picture of earlier, and Thomas Perrin. It's interesting that Kenyon met Perrin near the end of Kenyon's life. Perrin was a medical student looking for something to do, went down to the DC laboratory. Kenyon thought he was really promising and said, why don't you get into public health? Why don't you join the what used to be the Marine Hospital Service. By now, it was called the Public Health Service. He convinced Perrin to go into public health. He became one of the great Surgeon Generals. Uh, he was a Surgeon General during the time of the Roosevelt administration when all the great social legislation was enacted and always credited Kenyon as his uh, mentor and the guy who got him into public health. And then finally, Walter Reed, who 
uh, had been uh, just a regular old army doc for almost his whole army career, but in, in middle, middle age decided he wanted to come to Washington and learn how to be a scientist. And he did that, and when he came to Washington, he met Kenyon, and Kenyon must have identified something in him because he took him under his wing and mentored him and introduced him to Washington Scientific Society. Uh, and they remain friends and confidants. You can see, uh, just to show you, you can't read this obviously, but uh, there are personal letters that exist that are in the possession of the Kenyon family that show that uh, uh, Walter Reed was a real confidant of Kenyon, and there's some remarkable things in there, which I'll have to save for another time. But, uh, but Walter Reed admitted some of his foibles and his fears and things that he could never admit publicly to Kenyon. This is the chair and the desk that Kenyon used when he worked at home. This is a piece of furniture that he has. These are, these are obviously modern photographs. The, these possessions have been in the family. Um, there's endless amounts of buttons and ribbons and stuff that have been preserved. Uh, these are uniform insignias. Most of the ones you're looking at are from his army uniform in the last two years of his life. Um, mementos from his trip to see Baron Kitasato in Japan in 1902. And uh, the Hutchin sideboard is not Kenyon's, but all the china in it is stuff he collected when he was touring Asia in the early 1900s. So I think I'm going to stop now because we need to have time for questions. But I, there's a lot of people I want to thank, including Vicki Harden. Um, and some of the folks you see here, particularly I want to thank uh, all the NIH folks at NLM. Uh, the HMD staff has been great, Paul and John and others at NLM. Uh, the uh, Office of History, of course, I know Barbara's here, and um, the uh, uh, Betty Mergolo and the uh, Interlibrary Loan Team at NIH Library has been fantastic at finding every obscure thing I come up with, and um, many others, and I also want to acknowledge the help of, uh, of Ava Aron, who is our Seton Scholar I mentioned, and I hope maybe that some of you will get a chance to meet her uh, afterwards. So I think that's all I want to say now. Oh, I do want to thank... Uh, this is uh, one of Kenyon's great-grandchildren, Joe Kenyon Houts. You see him on the left. And uh, another grand, uh, great-granddaughter, Patricia Reeves, who have kept all these possessions in their uh, family uh, archives for all these years. And we hope we'll someday don donate them to the uh, National Institutes of Health. Some organization will, will, will leave it to the rest of us to fight over what that is. But Joe will be here in a few weeks. And anybody who'd like to meet Joe, uh, we can arrange that. He's very keen to come here to NIH and see what his great-grandfather started. So thank you all for listening to me, and if there's time left, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Well, uh, that's a, it's a good question, and uh, I, I, I could give a long answer, but I'm going to give the short answer. One of the reasons, I started doing this on my own just for the heck of it, because I was interested in it on my own private time, but at some point my boss, Dr. Fauci, got interested in it. I, I convinced him. It took me twice to convince him. One of the things that I do with Dr. Fauci is he and I write papers together, and of course I draft them and then he goes over them. And he got interested in writing a paper about Kenyon, and so I promised him I would get that ready for him. So the, the immediate thing is write, write a little scientific paper for a medical journal with Dr. Fauci. Um, but I think there's, uh, the, the materials I've collected over the last few years fill up, I think, 30 binders that are about three inch binders. There's over, three, uh, over 2,000 documents. And there are many more that we know about. I forgot to mention these little smiley faces you saw in all the photos are places where we think that uh, archival materials either exist or might exist that we have not yet seen, like the Rosena archives. So I've said to Ava that I think we already have enough material uh, to, uh, to make a, a significant biography and that uh, I'm hoping that we can convince her to stay long enough to do that. Uh, and uh, we'll see, but uh, whatever, whoever does it and however it gets done, uh, it's my intention that everything I've collected be part, you know, be here with everybody at NIH. It's open to everybody. And um, I hope we can get started to learn a little bit more about our founding father. Because after all, I think when we learn about who Joe Kenyon was, we're really going to be learning about ourselves. And it's, uh, I think it's time we start doing that. Uh, Mike. 
Well, it was, uh, they, they didn't uh, purify it. I can't tell you technically how it happened, but it was not unique. Uh, there was a lot of impurities that it had to do with the, with the technique for making the antiserums, and uh, they, were, they were made from horse serums, and various, they went through various processes, and probably you know, some contamination got in, some dirty contamination got in. Uh, I don't think it's known, but the history of the contamination of this lot in uh, 1901 is known. There have been histories written about it. I've never seen it said where the contamination came in, but we could try to track that down if you're interested. Oh, I'm sorry, Mike. Yeah, that's it's just a great story, and of course, uh, and I'm following this uh, progress of this closely. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak about evidence about um, Kenyon's uh, political, religious, social, intellectual milieu. Uh, so what circles did he move in? Did he attach this, his work to any other kinds of uh, agendas? That's a good question. Um, let me just, uh, rather than give a comprehensive question, let me mention a few things that might give you a flavor of who he was. He appears to be very progressive. Um, I don't know how he voted politically. Of course, at the time, the two major parties, Democrats and Republicans, were, stood for very different things than they stand for now. But clearly, he was a progressive. He was very interested in public health and social issues. He spoke on social issues a lot. Um, he and Lizzie Kenyon went to the Temple Baptist Church on Nebraska Avenue. Uh, he was also a Mason. Almost all the males in his family were Masons. And again, at the time, the Masons were still, I mean, things have changed a lot in, in Masonry since then, but the Masons had been very progressive when they were at their peak in the 1700s and were still regarded as being progressive um, in the late 1800s as well. So I think to, maybe to answer your question, uh, he, he, he hung around in progressive, forward-thinking, modern circles of men. He also became a member at the Cosmos Club and uh, dined with and uh, was frequently at social events with U.S. presidents and vice presidents, with future presidents like Taft and Woodrow Wilson, uh, with Alexander Graham Bell, I think, and various other, you know, various other leading men of the time. And, um, I, but I think he was not a, more of a social person. He, he comes across as being kind of a down-home Southern guy who probably didn't, even though he was in uniform all his life, he probably liked to relax in an informal way. He was kind of a good old boy from the South, and he grew up in the far West. And I mean, this, these are preliminary ideas about him. I can't say much more than that. And it's just speculation, so let's leave it at that. But I think if he were here today, I think most of us would find him a pretty likable, interesting guy. I uh, just wanted to comment briefly the, the, you know, the horse in, in, that was used in St. Louis to harvest the vaccine by the Municipal Health Department was, uh, of course, a source of the uh, tetanus. And it was- oh, You think it was in the horse serum itself? It, it was the horse that oh, had what? tetanus. Okay. Yeah. And that, that also you. spoke to the uh, poor manufacturing controls, which um, you know, was, was sort of the heart of what the, the 1902 law was all about. Um, and I also wanted to mention, you know, when, when he was in Germany in the 1890s, he wrote back to Surgeon General Wyman and had mentioned the, you know, the need to have some sort of controls here because once the, vac the right. diphtheria antitoxin uh, became producible, uh, it was pretty much a uh, uh, free market here. There's very little control. Right. They, yeah. Unlike the case in Germany, um, so you know clearly his 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 contributions to the regulatory aspects of what became NIH is is no doubt about that. A little bit of difference there, though, as far as uh, influence on what became FDA. Of course, that function of controlling biologicals eventually, you know, 70 years later, was transferred to FDA. But FDA's uh, sort of founding legislation had started long before right. the late right. 1870s. And you know, unlike the 1902 Act, which was uh, uh, debated for about a matter of weeks by Congress, uh, FDA's founding law actually was <laughs> took about 25 years. So, um, but but clearly his his role in, in, in you know starting a, you know a clear regulatory effort in, in this country with with medicinal products is 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 undisputed. Well, so thank, thank you, you for, for those that clarifications. Talk. I just I just want to say I didn't I didn't I had to you know in cutting corners here I didn't mean to imply that Joe Kennedy himself created the NIH and the FDA. Uh, in both cases, uh, with the FDA and the NIH, there was lots of legislation that was going along at the time. 
Uh, I, I think it's fair to say that he was a prime mover behind the ideas, but uh, at, at, during his time in, in service, but not the only one by any means, but certainly one of the prime movers. I want to comment on your comment about Germany. Um, you're, you're right. Um, the, uh, the, the, the ideas that uh, the, the Kenyans' uh, sort of obsession with the need to maintain standards and purity and biologicals, he, he himself directly attributed to a situation that happened in Germany when he was there in 1894. Uh, Koch was having a, um, an argument with the Prussian Ministry of Health about the very same thing, and Koch sat him down and said, you know, it's really important that we get control over these biologicals. And of course, Kenyon, knowing that back in the United States, with all this patent stuff all the way out there, there's, you know, it's a terrible situation, far worse than it was in Germany back in the States. So Kenyon apparently got religion right then in Berlin, and when he came back, um, he carried forward that idea of Koch's that we've got to get serious about maintaining standardization of, uh, of reagents and biologicals and quality control over them, which he envisioned best done by the government. Although, you know, states and local health departments started making biologicals right away, as well as private companies. John. I think by the time he was vindicated, uh, everybody sort of, you know, it's a, you have your 15 minutes of fame and he was out of the limelight. Um, and I think if you, if you go to the web today and, and Google Kenyon, you'll find all sorts of conspiracy theorist pages that's, that say Kenyon the terrorist and Kenyon the vicious racist and all these things. I think, you know, I mean, I think the evidence for that is pretty slim, but you know, it's very hard to tell about a person's character by reading what's in the news. And, and Ava and I have talked about this uh, as historians, the need to be very careful and look at the record and not try to either criticize Kenyon or defend him as being a saint. He was probably just a pretty normal human being with strengths and weaknesses. But uh, the, I think the, the record out there now today, if you, if you use Google or go on the web, there's a lot of stuff about Kenyon being a really evil guy. And I think almost certainly that's not true, but neither can we say he was a saint. He just seems to be a normal guy caught in the events of the time. Thank you all. Thanks, Jeff.